My name is Trey Reckling. I'm with the Academy of Cannabis Science, and we're so glad to have you all here today. We're particularly glad to welcome to Saturday Sesh for the first time, Allison Cutts. Allison is the CEO at Sound Horticulture, and not only that, she ran her own nursery for 30 years, I believe. And, and is incredibly successful, not only in helping people to grow plants, but what we're particularly interested in, cannabis plants. So she's from, uh, lives in Bellingham, Washington, and I'm gonna ask her to talk and, and tell us a little bit more about her. How you doing, Allison? Hey, I'm doing great. Uh, you guys can hear me? We can. Good, okay. Um, I always get confused with the mute. Um, Great. Well, um, it's a it's a very gray day here. I'm looking out at the the water and my chickens and my crazy garden, and I'm just so thankful, so thankful to have had all these years in the industry and to be able to have grown such a wide array of plants um, in my life. And uh, I know Trey was kind of curious, like, what, you know, how did you get into this? And um, so the bottom line is that my Nana, um, my grandmother was crazy about plants. And in the Pacific Northwest, we have so many things that we can grow and it's such a moderate climate. So when I was a, a little girl, she dragged me to these uh, Primrose Society um, flower shows and, you know, um, getting to know all these different genera of plants. And so hanging out in her garden, which was a beautiful woodland garden, she had collections of hostas and ferns and all of that. So I think that's what got me going. And then by the time I was in like whatever, high school, um, grade school, high school, I was just surrounded by plants and animals the whole rest of my life. And then started this nursery in Bellingham uh, called Cascade Cuts. And I just wanted to grow herbs. And so anything useful, functional, aromatic, medicinal, uh, that had my attention, especially because nobody else was really diving in. So I was fortunate enough to have some mentors and a bunch of great people to bounce around with um, Canadian growers and actually those Canadian growers, um, just because we're so close to the border, those Canadian borders, the Canadian growers, they were pretty hip because they were growing, you know, hothouse tomatoes, peppers, um, all of these vegetables, and they were starting to experiment with uh, biological control back back in the day in the late 70s, early 80s, and there wasn't much known. Um, but if you could imagine those Canadian growers from the north, you know, this corner of Vancouver, um, Vancouver, BC area, many of them were Dutch. And you know what they say, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. So those Dutch growers, they really had <laughs> their act together as far as um, the early years of using biological control. So that's how I kind of got started with all, all of that. So um, I guess that's, that's sort of my intro, which, you know, I did that for 30 years, stepped out of my own nursery and um, about well, around 2000 started Sound Horticulture. So now what we do is we help um, all sorts of growers um, around, mostly around the US, but throughout North America, um, mostly with beneficial insects and biological control. Um, but we, yeah, we just ask a lot of questions, try to figure out where somebody's growing, how they're growing, are they growing, you know, in a in a in a closet? Are they growing in a greenhouse? Are they growing in a big, large, professional, multi-tier grow indoor? Or are they field growers? Um, you know, each of these situations is different. So that's what we'll talk a little bit about today. Great, and so that's fascinating because, of course, the Dutch are known also for their cannabis farming and and yeah. genetics. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you probably get to tap into or have conversations about that as well. When, um, when were you able to come out and, and work openly with cannabis and cannabis farms? Did that just happen organically, so to speak? Uh, well, you know, we messed around and grew some of our own plants back, back in the day, but, you know, legally could not really. So, um, hanging out with, uh, actually a spiritual mentor of mine, George Dalen, who is now deceased, um, he was an ex-CIA agent and he, uh, totally intriguing guy. Um, he was such an amazing gardener and one of the many, many things he would do would be growing medical cannabis, mostly for himself and a few friends in need. And so hanging out with him, um, getting just getting into his philosophy of why and how he was doing what he was doing that was probably my my earliest exposure and then as sound horticulture kind of got really rolling 
we started getting inquiries uh, maybe 15 years ago for certain odd predators which mm -hmm. are almost impossible to get a hold of still today they're some of the more like the predator insects that are really good for say spider mite control so i'd start to hear these requests and i'd kind of you know then i'd start asking these growers more questions and um so, so a lot of it is you know really vicarious so until things really came into the light um and became you know much less um stigmatized in the last say seven eight years um you know now it's just it's a it's a wide open game and it's so amazing getting to walk into so many of these different growing operations uh each of the facilities is designed differently um there's a lot of problems with facility design um and there's a lot that has been figured out in the last, just especially in the last like five years. So that's what's been, I think, most intriguing is that it's always a journey and there's always something to learn from every single grower that we, we speak with. And now we have a team at Sound Horticulture. So there's three kind of technical people. So we're just we're just taking it in and, and, and supporting as many people as we can. And every day we're just learning more. So I had to, I had to mute, sorry, I'm, my Boston Terrier snores like a, like a big person um and so she uh so since you've had the opportunity to work with cannabis for a number of years are there any practices you wish would just go away some things that and, and maybe that's a long list but i, I know you know I, you hear all kind of crazy stuff about things that people do from planting a fish in their soil to urinating on their plants like crazy stuff that that right for the new for the uh, nitrogen um all kind of crazy stuff that gets passed down in a in an illicit market but are there some things that make you want to pull your hair out and say why are you still doing this oh that's a really good question i think uh there's so many of those little homeowner things that i think you just you know you could just clip off a dozen of them um but i'm i'm more tuned into working with some of these facilities where you step in the front door or you, you know, you're, you know, walking through on FaceTime with somebody. And one of the first questions I ask is where are your stock plants or what we'd call the mothers, where are the moms, and then where's your cloning area or, you know, your propagation area. So the terminology, um, you know, like in, in professional horticulture would be, you know, propagation, stock plants so you've got a stock plant management situation these moms but you walk in and you see that these um you know mature stock plants these mamas are sitting right next to where the cloning area is and so with that you have old tired plants and they're people always hang on to the stock plants the moms way too long so keeping um nutrition up and stress to a minimum so that the vigor and the tissue is um, absolutely perfect. So you can manage those plants so that when you take those cuttings, those clones, that they're all going to root. You should have 100% rooting. The last thing you want is the contamination of a pest infestation, even a low level pest infestation tracking from those clones to, you know, from the moms to the clones. And I think that is the worst case scenario is that most of these facilities that were designed in the last 10 years um, have these areas uh, together. And so unfortunately, um, it's taking a long time to undo this and the, the problem has even become um, more pronounced, especially end of the winter right now, early spring, because a lot of the growers are trying to propagate like crazy and get enough plant material so that they've got enough to move into, say, outdoor greenhouses or field production, or they might even be starting um, smokable, you know, hemp plants. So the pressure from above, from like these investors saying you need to produce X is so great that the space, pre the pressure for space to grow the plants adequately is um, definitely overstressed. And so that means if you can't space the plants out correctly um, with light and air movement, then you're subject to having a lot more problems down the road. So it just leads to stretched out plants and um, yeah, it's really rough on the plants. So keeping stress to a minimum is the key. So those main factors are what we see just still lingering in the industry. And, and for those of you who might not be aware, uh, generally recreational or don't use cannabis or legal cannabis 
is a clone game. So people are not popping seeds. They're taking an exact replica of the mother plant, like you mentioned. And so, um, so you know that everything, you know, you've got uniformity in, in nutrient needs and lighting needs or as, as much as close as you can get. And um, so let's back up for a second because I know um, our audience here um, might be getting ready to grow patio tomatoes this summer, might be getting ready to grow some cannabis. What are some first things we need to think about when it comes to soil? Because I know everybody wants to think about seeds but but the soil is critical what are some things you hope that we would do and not do when it comes to sourcing soil that's a good question because there are some really good organic soils out there on the market and you can buy you know bagged organic potting soil mm -hmm. um if you just are walking into a lowe's or home depot you're probably not going to be too satisfied with what you're gonna find so I would go to a good grow shop and buy something that is, you know, labeled as organic um, and don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money. Um, unfortunately, we see some of these soils are so um, overbuilt. Mm -hmm. um, so they're being coined as living soils, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's a great, it's a great term. Um, it should just mean like, oh, that, that means there's microbial activity. So there's going to be a cycling of nutrients um, and it's going to be predicated upon the fact that there's um, a good level of carbon that's decomposing at the right rate um, and present microbes that can help kind of assist that whole um, manipulation. Um, so the microbes in the soil blend um, should naturally be there to some degree. Um, our nursery, uh, I guess, the thing I learned during nursery operations is I was doing a lot of, you know, quick turns of a lot of plants that had um, perhaps a crop cycle or a lifespan um, in the container, rather small containers. So the larger the container you're growing in, the more opportunity you have to add um, a little bit slower, um, high lignin cellulose materials that would be slower to break down over time. Um, but all of that is predicated by how long is that plant going to stay in that size pot. So mm -hmm. it's easy to kind of want to overpot something like a little tiny start into a really big pot. And then often there's overwatering then the first couple of weeks of production, like in the vegetative stage. So um, often pro problems will crop up right then, especially if it's kind of, I call it like the over goosed soil that's perhaps got just piles of things like tons of composted uh, material, um, a lot of like um, fish waste, um, high levels of th additives like bat guano and um, blood meal, um, things that are high in nitrogen, um, those things can really spike um, other problems. So it, in, a, in a way, you don't necessarily need all of that. Um, plants in containers especially respond really well to being kind of spoon fed shall we say, spoon fed over time. So that might mean, um, it might mean a conventional fertilizer that has salts, or it may just mean like, oh, adding compost tea with some fish fertilizer. Um, so it kind of depends on what's actually in that soil medium um, and how, mm, you know, how overbuilt that soil is. If you were to steer towards sort of the lighter side, like even something like a sunshine number four mix, and then adding, uh, say, 10% really good compost to that, blending that well, um, and then feeding that weekly, say, with um, something as simple as I'm just thinking of organic farming techniques, like, you know, fish fertilizer plus kelp, maybe some compost teas. Um, that could be in itself, the simplest way to kind of bring up the microbial activity in the soil and get you most of what you are looking for. Interesting, and, and I think um, throughout that, we I hear in your messaging, you know, uh, there's a push for people, especially if you go into a hydro store, there's all these nutrients on the on the wall, and they really, they want you to have like this, uh, this roided out plant that's going to produce six, plant, six pounds of buds. And in some ways, we're asking plants to do things that are very unnatural. You know, it's like asking a 10-year-old to go lift a lot of weights that are not appropriate for that age person. So could you talk a little bit about, about nutrients? I know some people don't realize that a lot of the nutrients we find, especially like you said, Home Depot or Lowe's, are going to be petroleum-based waste products 
um, as opposed to organic materials. Are there some things that we need to be aware of there? Yeah, I think one of the questions you were curious about was um, what happens when people fertilize with high salt fertilizers. And so um, there is a lot of, um, you know, um, organic salts that are, you know, for in these fertilizers and there's four main ones and they can cause a lot of burning to the plants if you over fertilize. And so if you've already got a highly charged soil with lots of your um, natural, you know, fertility, you don't want to go too high with the salts. And so one way um, of, of measuring and discussing that is by the use of an EC meter. So electrical conductivity um, is the measure of, of the, the movement of salts. So if, the, if you have a high level of soluble salts in your, in your blend, and then you say, for instance, you're in a small greenhouse operation, you mix those soluble salts um, the inorganic fertilizer um, into a tank. And a lot of people will use an injector or a proportioner that will then feed it into the system. Um, if the EC level, the soluble salts are too high and you are trying to also keep say microbes alive in the soil, you it's like popping little osmotic bubbles. So bacterium especially uh, does not respond well to high levels of salts being present. And so if you over fertilize, you're basically kind of popping all those little natural, you know, bacterial bubbles, and you're going to be releasing twice as much nutrient as you even need. Um, so it's a pretty complex topic. I started thinking about the best way to answer this, and I realized there are some really good papers out. And I found one last night just thinking about the comparative levels of toxicities between um, fertilizers, high salts, which is a big deal in agriculture as well, um, and the toxicity as, as it would affect microbial populations, microbial diversity, and then um, also just the, the sheer numbers. And interestingly, like I know it's really valid when you think about um, something like mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae are symbiotic fungi that live in association with a root hair. And there's a lot of chatter going back and forth. And those things work together to the mycorrhizae will grow. And as it's growing, it's actually um, taking a little charge of um, free um, sugary exudates that the root is producing. And then that's kind of feeding that little my the mycorrhizae onward, onward, outward. Um, the gift back that the mycorrhizae does in exchange is it just is able to rail car and channel those nutrients back to the root, which is a pretty cool deal for everybody involved. So when somebody um, feeds with too high phosphorus of a fertilizer, it can really put a dent into that like really expensive, um, you know, mycorrhizal fungi inoculum that the grower may have added to say the container at the time of planting. Um, a little bit of a punch of maybe too high phosphorus or a concentrated fertilizer down the road after the mycorrhizae is established is actually um, not as big of a deal as if you did, if you throw all of these things into, you know, the pot at the same time. So, you know, if you're interested in mycorrhizae, I'd say get the mycorrhizae started first as early in the crop cycle as you can, mm -hmm. um, and then kind of start adding things only as needed. So um, there, the, but that the paper, if you wanted to email me, I'll send you a link for that um, very complicated paper that's explaining, um, which is kind of just shedding light on some, one of the misnomers um, in cannabis, especially, is that you can't have the best of both worlds, that you're either growing with living soil or you're growing with salts. Um, the bottom line is that we've been using like compost teas for years in situations that have kind of a, like a organic light medium, uh, having great results and do, no detriment. And I hadn't seen all the data on that. I knew it was true inherently and in just talking to different microbiologists, but I feel like I finally found the paper that, that explains all that. So let me know if you want that, I'll, I'll get that to you. No, I would love to. I'll tag it. Um, we're going to post this on YouTube, so we'll. Uh, I'll tag it on, in the description of the YouTube. So if anybody wants to catch that on the backside, it'll be available to you. So we're talking about salts. We're talking about. Uh, we know those salts build up over time and and sometimes have to be rinsed or flushed from the soil, just because it can just be too much. 
could you talk to us just briefly about and we haven't even gotten to bugs and 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 so much of what you do is bugs but um water you know some people are just going to pour tap water on their plants could you tell us about why you might not want to do that and why maybe bubbling water or some other source might be the way to go interesting i hadn't thought about that but i guess that's probably what a lot of homeowners do and maybe it's in 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 the chitter chat on the internet and i don't look at all of that stuff always so it's fun to hear like what oh okay um well for instance um in the use of like in your if you were actually brewing a compost tea with a good um a compost tea brewer that was adding high levels of aeration so you're growing an aerobic um, group of organisms hopefully high diversity with the right feedstocks and um, food resources anyway that material like that's just so important how you do what you do um, in that regard we've always would recommend that somebody uses dechlorinated water some water systems actually have another chemical besides chlorine called chloramine so if you're living in like a high agricultural um, area you might actually be concerned about that because that would certainly kill a lot of the microbes if you were trying to um, really deliver um, a high quality say tea um, whether or not the concentration in say tap water out of the tap just watered on a plant that had some uh, microorganisms in it would cause a lot of damage. Um, I think the jury would be out on that because um, even the concentrations of chlorine and chloramine that might be in say city water, that that could change over the course of a season. So as uh, things get drier and hotter, um, they often have to crank the amount of um, sanitation um, materials that are put into municipal water. So um, if you are concerned about that and testing, keep in mind that you might want to test at a few points during the season. Um, the chloramine problem hopefully is not too huge yet, but that's much, much harder to get rid of than chlorine, which you can just, you know, if you have a fish tank bubbler and you you just want to kind of pre-treat your water, you can, you can even just bubble that water for uh, even an hour under most circumstances would um, basically volatize those, um, those molecules. So they're, they're out of there, they're evaporating. And, and that's great. So, you know, I got ahead of myself. Somebody asked, what is compost tea? Um, could you describe what it's kind of like farming before you uh, before you water with it, right? I mean, you're you're growing your own little environment of of living organisms to to feed and water with together, right? Yeah, um, the whole m movement um, and the science behind this. I mean, people have been doing compost teas or basically like leaching fluid from piles of compost or worm casting leachate um, that's anaerobic um, I mean for thousands of years it goes back to the Roman Roman times where they would have like jugs of fermenting plant material and use that um, extract um, to um, to water their plants in with and there could certainly be lots and lots and lots of good reasons in fact there's even um, some early studies back in the 70s and 80s on some disease suppression found in totally anaerobic compost leachates you know um, so there's there's not an absence of data to support that however the movement of the whole um, compost tea um, world has been based on highly aerobic or aerated compost teas. So those start out as really good um, composts. And um, I did three years worth of research and it was interesting data collection, looking at um, like 12 different regional composts here in the Pacific Northwest and what their feedstocks were, what were in them, whether it was organic blueberry waste and no animal manures, um, except for a mouse that climbed into the compost pile and whoops, okay, well, that could be an introduction of E. coli. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, raw manures are like, eh, no, no, no. Um, but um, even say something like dairy compost. And if you could take your dairy compost and um, pre-comp or dairy manure and pre-compost it so it goes through the heat process, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's the process to further reduce pathogens. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to the U.S. Composting Council site. But that PFRP is really important. So the heat that the microbes produce, um, even if they're not tumbled and they're just in a like a windrow situation, um, those microbes are going to build over time. It's like lemmings coming up to the, the cliff. Um, this microbial peak will happen at the same time the temperature is rising in the compost pile. When the temperature gets to like 140, it's like curtains for a lot of the microbes, both beneficial but also the deleterious. So the pathogens just get knocked off. The temperature plummets and then often a composter will turn the pile again, da da da. So during that process, you reduce those pathogens over time and with that process. When that material, whether it's um, dairy waste, um, is basically finished or mostly finished, say it's three quarters finished, it's like 85%. That's a great time. Like if you're doing vermicompost, if you're raising worms, you can take that pre-composted material and then feed that to your worm bins or you know your worm production. And then you've got, I call it like a biscotti cookie. You've got a twice baked cookie because the worms start working through the material and it goes through their mouths but they're also slithering past it. And so they've got a set of microbes on the outside of their body and then a whole different set on the inside of their body. So as they do their magic, then the resulting vermicompost is phenomenal to put into to these compost heap brewers because it's just, it's clean. There's no human pathogens, you know, um, but it is nice. Like we've gone through a lot of testing to make sure that there's, you know, no um, problems going into say the tea brewing cycle. Then you can put this material into a basket. There's lots of variations on the theme. Aerate, highly aerate. And we work with a, a company that builds machines called Growing Solutions. And so that stuff's on our website. You can read more. Um, there's also some good um, publications. Atra has a good one. Um, that's the appropriate technology transfer for rural areas. So they've got a, some great, you know, um, free information on the internet. Um, I can link you to a lot of that stuff. Anyway, so compost teas are generally brewed um, with a little bit of extra food and that should be really a complex carbohydrate, nutrients like you know kelp and humic acid and um, fulvic acid and um, some rock dust like azomite rock dust. So you've got, you're really adding the periodic table so that those organisms that were reared in say a compost get more of the um, sensation that they have a whole, the whole palate, they have the whole periodic table to munch on while they're in the brew, the brew cycle. So the bacterium and the fungi are pulled off of the compost, they start going just crazy and they can every 20 minutes, the bacterium for instance, can double in suspension. So by the time you've brewed for like 18 to 24 hours generally, you know, you've got a really sweet, sweet slurry and it smells good too, because it smells like good earthy soil. Um, and then that is then subsequently diluted and then the plants are fed with that. So people will often add a little extra uh, food resource, say they wanted to kind of spike it with a little fish fertilizer or add an additional microbial uh, material. Say they were worried about powdery mildew and they wanted to add some a product like cease, which is a vaccilla subtilis, they can they can kind of spike their brew and kind of tweak and tailor it a little bit at post brew. So there's a lot of people doing a lot of um, pretty cool, pretty crazy some of it stuff, but um, a lot of it is just like just simple part of their protocol and part of their fertility management. So but that's tease in a nutshell. <laughs> well, and and thanks for for bringing that down because I know. Um, like we talked before this event started, we could take any one of these topics and I know you could speak, we could take up the whole time just talking about what, go, you know, the living environment that goes on in the soil or, or uh, nutrients or, or light or wind or anything. I will tell you, we've got some good questions here from, um, let's see, who is it? Fletus, you've got some good questions there. Would you pick your favorite and, and go ahead and ask Allison yourself? And if your if your mic's not working, that's fine. I will ask. Do we have you? We can't hear you. I'm going to ask the first one. Any change of soils, um, any uh, change of soils when we're planning for growth needs. So when we're repotting, do I need to be? Um, can I just add the same sort of soil? Do I need to be uh, trying to break that soil off a little bit as I put it into the pot? What are what are some keys to good repotting? 
a good question. So um, often it depends on what you were rooting that cutting into, or if you were actually in like a seedling medium, if you were popping seeds, or if you had, you know, stuck a cutting and done a clone, um, and what kind of material was that? So people will be propagating into rock wool medium, um, into the little, you know, spongy foam cubes, um, that kind of thing. Um, and then often those would be like, um, we'd call them in the trade, we'd call them like 72s. And that would be because, be because a, a tray that's 21 inches by like nine and a half, 10 inches, uh, contains 72 cells per tray. So um, from that 72, uh, that medium is usually, you know, it could be an artificial substrate or a seedling medium, depending. So from there, um, often people will be moving into like a quart or a gallon. Um, so that pop into the quart or the gallon, that first shift, um, can be um, a fairly fine medium still. I wouldn't go with like huge chunks of bark or like a perennial soil or like one of those really cheap soils from whatever, you know what I mean, <laughs> the chains. Um, however, if you were growing a full long-term, long-term full season crop and you were growing in like a big, like a smart bag or a hundred gallon or even a 30 gallon, you might step it up to something a little coarser. So um, with each shift up of pot size, um, you've all, it sounds weird. It's a whole nother study in itself, but you have the water storage holding capacity of that soil. So the particle size makes a big difference as far as the drainage um, and the capacity of that soil. So you just, it's still really important to have not have too fine of a soil in too large of a pot because you wouldn't get the uh, adequate drainage. So you do want to think about, you know, the physical components and the makeup of the soil as well as the nutrients that you're adding. The deal, because some people don't understand they can actually, you can drown your plants. Those roots need to breathe. And so if you're watering too frequently, you can do just as much damage if you're not watering enough, right? Yeah, yeah, that's very true. So the plants that get waterlogged after that first shift, moving from, say, you know, the plug or 72 to, a say, a gallon, some folks will just go, bam, I'm going straight into a whatever, 10 gallon or a 30 gallon from a plug. And uh, the main problem we see within two weeks is an explosion of fungus gnats. And mm -hmm. so if you're going to do something like that, I'd say, gosh, think about adding um, some of the beneficial mites. Like there's a soil dwelling mite called stratiolalaps. And if you put the strat mites in there, um, you just stick them on the soil surface, they'll burrow around and they'll be um, searching for um, problems like, like the fungus gnats, which are in there, um, in the little larvae. They look like little white worms with a little black head. And those things will do so much damage to your fine hairs, the plant, the roots. So the strat mites or stratiolalaps can be good preventative medicine. Um, there's another little tiny beetle that is used called delosia um, or rove beetle that can help burrow around and go after, you know, problems that occur with, um, you know, soil dwelling pests. And, um, yeah, sometimes people go like the overwatering in the first couple of weeks will cause that explosion of fungus gnats. So monitoring for those with yellow sticky cards and, you know, recognizing what you're looking at. So it's like, is that a root aphid or is that a fungus gnat? Is it a fungus mm -hmm. gnat or is it a shore fly? Hmm. And then changing the cards regularly so you actually can see, do I have a spike in a problem? Um, what's my threshold for tolerance? Am I moving in the wrong direction or the right direction? Are those counts dropping? Um, if the counts are going up because of that over overwatering and the plants are like, hey, you know, they can't breathe, then um, if there are those explosions of, say, fungus gnats um, or even problems with thrips, drenching with beneficial nematodes, so doing a suspension of these little microscopic roundworms can be super helpful. So the um, the nematodes, we have a lot of information about that on our website, but um, they are just really popular, especially for the um, the home growers as well as in commercial um, situations. So uh, and all I would, those. No, and I'm sorry. I, I was going to say um, for those of you who are home growers of cannabis and other things, rather than just jumping on Google, um, and that's one answer. But you might want to consider calling sound horticulture one of the things allison mentioned were the sticky cards and these are just like a imagine a fly trap but designed for your garden 
and they just have sticky stuff on them so any bugs flying around your garden are likely to get stuck to them so you can at least get a closer look and see what you got um, it, I'm sure it can cut down on the numbers too but in, it, it by itself it's not going to get rid of the problem so hit up a pro like Allison and say hey do you have bugs for me because it's a different way to think right we would normally think hey what can I spray or pour on this that will kill the bug but of course those of us who are growing for medical cannabis can't be putting poison on our plants right a poison that'll kill a bug might not be good for us so we got to keep that in mind and so that's why a resource like allison is so critical um fletus had another question are there friendly plants that can be grown with marijuana plants and we had talked about this you and i whether uh trap plants or plants that that might ward off insects um that's something i've been i've been doing and having some success with would you give us some advice on that um yeah there's a lot of different categories it was interesting fleetus that you use the word friendly plants so when when somebody says the word friendly i think well that's 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 giving you some sort of benefit so um categorically um i'd say that would probably be um best described as an insectary plant something that if you well if you're indoors in a very tight enclosed situation and there's not really um light or air movement from outside then um something that would be attractive to native beneficial insects or native predators is probably not going to do you much good but if you're um, trying to create plant like healthy plant root exudates and do a cover crop, which is a lot of what you're reading about um, on the internet, um, and as it pertains to indoor grows, then I think there is some validity to that. And so um, we were talking, I think Trey the other day about um, this kind of boost people talking about dichondra and i'm not even sure where that came from but the idea there is is you've got a shallowly rooted little ground cover that's going to be pumping out you know sugary exudates and adding um, food for the microbes in the soil well there's lots of ways to do that and there might even be easier ways to do that um trey i, th I found it interesting that you said that you were using you were using that cover crop actually as an indicator for your eyes to say okay the plant's getting dry i can tell now i need to water so you know plants will plants are our messengers they will tell us a lot of things um we work a lot with uh greenhouse growers that will um and outdoor growers that be wanting to be using um banker plants for one so a banker plant that's a different thing a banker plant would be something like a flowering pepper with a lot of pollen, um, an ornamental pepper like pepper purple flash, or uh, there's a little dianthus called dianthus kohori is the um, variety. And uh, both of those plants actually create a bunch of pollen and they're super attractive to, um, th th there's a naturally occurring predator of thrips, Western flower thrips, which is a big problem in cannabis. And you can use that as a host plant um, for your aureus, these beneficial little aureus, um, they're a minute pirate bug is the nickname, but you can bring in aureus, introduce them at the front end of the crop cycle, and then keep them really happy on these little pollen producing plants. And so if you're producing um, pollen that can be sustained, you're actually going to, you know, if you're focused on a biocontrol program, why not grow your own? So the idea is, um, you know, production and how can I get cycle, how can I get cycles of these insects? So every insect has a different set of needs, but if you have a generalist predator or a predator that actually co-feeds on pollen, then it's a very worthwhile venture to think about um, host plants, um, you know, or banker plants is the other term that we use for it. So uh, when you use the word trap plants, trap plants would be normally something like an eggplant or a bush bean. And you put those in the greenhouse and you're going to see right away if you have spider mites because they're going to be like whoop, just attracted. But then you don't let those plants hang out. You know, you get them the heck out of there. You know, you put a bag over them and remove them and um, really get them kind of off campus. Uh, so yeah, there's many ways you can use plants as indicators, as traps, as beneficial hosts, as attractants to things that you don't want to have to purchase, um, but ways to kind of build that biodiversity in your grow system. Does that help? That was very helpful, Allison. Thank you. Um, I have a 
question just quickly. Um, there's never a quick answer, right? But what do you do with plants that you do move out? I'm, I'm talking like house plants, right? Right now I'm, uh, for a while I had um, a plant, I couldn't figure out which one finally did, but that had little, you know, gnat looking things and I don't know what they were. And so I put the bag over it and then I'm like, what do I do with it now? Do I take it outside? Right, it's colder, the climate's different. So uh, what's the like, quick one, two, three step that you do with a plant that has pests and you're trying to remove from, from your, your home environment? Well, you can um, get some little sticky cards and try to figure out, first of all, what is the pest? So um, it's super, super common, especially at the end of the winter. You know, we've been kind of overwatering our plants a little bit mm -hmm. in the house and getting excited about spring. So fungus gnats are probably what you saw on those plants. However, taking something that's a super tropical plant and throwing it out on your deck in March might be a little harsh. Right. So um, the simple thing to do is, is, well, you know, kind of really examine your watering technique can you back off on the watering? Is that plant sitting in standing water for too long? Hmm, you can scratch, scratch the surface of the soil up. You can also drench with those beneficial nematodes. You can do that with your house plants. So people do this all the time. We get more and more and more with the whole house plant craze. People asking us all the time, what can we do to control fungus gnats and thrips and spider mites? Mm -hmm. So it just depends what it is, but you can add those um, soil mites, those stratiolalaps mites. You can drench with nematodes. And those would be two main things. And that would just like knock those fungus gnats silly sideways. So they'll be like gone, gone. So especially toads are pretty quick. You could do that like a couple times, like five days apart um, at a very low rate. And yeah, it works really well. I'm excited to try the cards, uh, you know, yeah. so that because that's the whole thing is like, how do you get one? And then by the time you get it, it's not, it's not all in one piece sometimes. <laughs> so, right. uh, you know, you, it's good to be able to see that. Yeah. So right picture and you can text it to me and I'll say oh yeah um, because oh, okay. we've also got little uh, microscopes oh, I don't have one right here that clip on to the back of our phones oh uh, fantastic and iPads also so if we're trying to detect whether or not we have like russet mites or something really microscopic you may have to kind of drill down a step further and take it up to 30 or 40 power um, but okay. get a good diagnostic and then you're not throwing the kitchen sink at something, you know. That's kind of where, yeah, that's kind of what I was doing. So I appreciate the tips. Thanks, Allison. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're on mute, my friend. If y'all are lucky enough to see Allison or Sound Horticulture in events, sometimes they'll bring their microscopes and they'll have the bugs. I, that's one of the places I think I've talked to you, Allison, is is have some of these beneficial insects right there so you can see them and it's fascinating you know the, the there is a world all around us and on us of bugs that we don't see so um so sometimes it's just one knowing that this exists two like jessica said hey taking time to think about it and say oh how can i think about this differently and then reaching out to a resource that you all now know i've put um sound horticulture's link in the chat as well as um so look them up there like allison said um there's a bunch of information there also fleetus you had asked about um a mix for your um for your bubble for your compost tea i know allison they sell some great mixes there that that you can use for that tea and so uh, even if you're not ready to go with one of the really really nice brewers that they have get started buy a five gallon bucket and an aquarium bubbler and 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 get started it's it it doesn't have to be um you know it doesn't have to be intimidating and you're gonna you know you're gonna learn and it, just like growing plants you're gonna kill some but hopefully you learn and we encourage you guys to take notes you know take notes about what you're doing so you remember to do that thing again or not do that thing again unless you just have a better memory than i do um allison gosh we could easily spend another hour with you but we're so grateful that you've taken time today to be with us and talk to us and uh so thank you for taking time thanks you guys this has been a lot of fun and it's just wonderful to see your faces out there i wish i could see every single one of them <laughs> but um I, so oh there's an empty chair hi jessica there she is <laughs> all right i think we've met before and it's great to see keith again um and yeah definitely recognize a number of you guys and 
Chuck, I think we've met as well. So good luck to everybody down there at UNLV. I hope you guys have an awesome, awesome series of classes and um, continue to learn a lot. And if you need help or guidance or want to ever talk about like, you know, jobs in the industry and who's looking for what and, um, you know, talk to me. It's, it's really, this is all such a big network and we're all in this together and we want to see the whole industry uh, progress as the way it is in such a positive manner. And I really appreciate the work Trey is doing. So it's nice to finally make this connection. And if we can do any more of this for you, I'd be really, really glad to help. And we have a lot of PowerPoints and a lot of real like illustrations, you know, that would help. Oh, let's, if you let's ever talk. Want to do that. Okay. I want to come up. I want to come up to the uh, where you are. I want to see the bug factory. Cool. All right. <laughs> Any old time. So thanks so much, you all. I know it's uh, getting on past one, but um, yeah, I could stick around for a few more minutes if you had questions or if you need to wrap it up. That's fine. No, we want to. Yeah, we want to be respectful of your time. Um, I did put the uh, the links in for our YouTube. So if you enjoyed today and you would like to see who else have they had on as guests, I missed the chat with Dr. Uma Danavalon. Boy, Dr. Uma was fantastic. Just as if you enjoyed today, you're also going to enjoy Dr. Uma. Um, that was all about medical cannabis and not using opioids. And and, and so, but we've got a, a variety of people, and we we have some really smart friends. Um, and so we enjoy uh, we encourage you to follow us there. And also the Cannabis Alliance events, all those are free, and y'all are welcome to attend. Like we said, this Wednesday at noon, we're going to have a chat about Delta Eight. So if you're wondering what is this new isomer and how are people getting high from a legal substance or when is it going to, you know, how long is it going to stay legal? We're going to try to answer a lot of those questions. So hope you can join us. Thank you all so much. Um, that's the, oh, and thanks, thanks for the link on uh, Jessica on Delta 8. That's in there too. So I'll leave this open long enough that you, call, you all can copy those links. But thank you so much for joining us for Saturday session. We'll be back. Thank you. Oh, Absolutely. Awesome. We'll be back the, the next Saturday, first Saturday of every month. So keep an eye on us. Follow us uh, on Facebook. You'll get all those notices. All right. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much. Have a good Saturday. You too.